to what's needed. Okay. Patrick, you're going to be talking to us about internal leadership. And this mm -hmm. is stuff that you have been developing over the years alongside your coaching colleagues. Um, this is something you have a great experience in. And I am, as everybody else is looking forward to, to hearing what you have to say. My first question really would be, because I'm about to say over to you and I've got a cup of tea here and I'm going to start drinking, but what exactly do you mean by internal leadership and, and why does it matter? Well, what a great way to start. Wasn't it just? Because I've got a couple of examples that I'm going to, this is all about practical experience mm -hmm. today. This is about what I've learned from, because I always think I learn as much from the teams I work with as they ever learn from me um, because every time you do a piece of work with a team there's something yeah. different there's something new um, so what I'm going to do today is use examples from a couple of teams that I've worked with over the last few years Brilliant. that really illustrate what this is all about and actually just to say a little bit more about that um, I thought it'd be useful to give a bit of a flavor around internal leadership what it is and, and why it matters. Uh, there's an impact model that I've been developing with a couple of coaching friends of mine, Glenn Wallace and David Pilbeam, which puts it into puts this whole business of internal leadership into context within teams. And then I thought it would be good to share a couple of examples um, and get people's input to those examples. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we've got the advantage of, I don't know, 96 pairs of eyes on, on this today. Uh, crikey, yes. Yeah. So Let's get some input, I think. Yeah. yeah. So, so let's, let's, let's have 192 eyes looking in on these and going, yeah, what do I make of this? Yeah. And then, yeah, really importantly, um, how does Belbin relate to this? Because it's, it's a core tool that I use with this work. How have, I, how have we been using this? What does it help us to understand about what's going on? And more important, how does it help people who are leaders within teams? So actually inside the team, trying to take a role in leading that team. Um, how does it help them to understand what it is they need to do? Wonderful. So here's a picture. Uh, I think we've all been in this meeting. Um, I think you and I had a chat about this. We did, yes. Um, uh, this is the meeting where all of the energy that's flowing is really going in a very specific direction. And it's very typical uh, of the nature of the challenges that we often face, particularly when we're dealing with senior teams. Mm. Um, this is, this by the way, is captured from the, the, the marks that you see in the middle of the screen here were originally real pencil marks on a piece of paper that I did in the real meeting with these people around the table. So we've got the, the nominal leader, the head of the team, the person who's, uh, whose name is at the top of the org chart. In this case, a director of a function in a large organisation. Uh, and around him... Um, a number of people who he'd recruited in. They were actually all recent recruits or recent promotions because he was building this team from scratch with a really big business challenge, which was to turn around uh, the way that the business was operating within about 18 months. So, yeah, quite a big ask. So this team's got a lot to do. Let's look at how the energy is flowing. So the lines that are radiating out here just mark whenever somebody broadcasts something. Okay. And the lines, the, the they're supposed to be straight lines. Um, I didn't, I didn't have a ruler with me, and I, I was literally drawing on a pad on my lap, sat in the corner of the room watching the meeting. And um, these represent um, interactions between individuals. I wonder you know, okay. if we put the pairs of eyes that, that in this mm. room, what do people notice? What's going on? Where's the energy flowing in this meeting? I'm trying to keep quiet here because it just screams, doesn't it? This is almost like a, a mini Bales analysis, isn't it? Which they did in that original work at Belbin, you know, analysing who's saying what. Um, 
but in this case it's who's speaking and then who are they speaking with who are they speaking to directly yeah there is there's actually a word for this graph i discovered it oh, is there? Is, there is it's called um it is called a an energy focused network diagram energy net focused network oh. diagram um, and i originally came ac across these absolute yonks ago when i was studying animal behavior as a, as a student uh, it turns out to work really well with human animals as well <laughs> um, and a bit like like you say a bit like bale's analysis you just yeah. sit there in the corner of the room making the observations and it paints a picture so as suki is saying you know it's coming from the leader from the nominal mm. leader um and from also as simon says from the from the hr partner as well you can just see it can't you just in front of you the visual impact i agree claire is is quite stunning it's showing that it's the nominal leader and the hr partner they are the ones who are communicating but also are communicating a lot with each other mm -hmm. yeah so there's yeah. a lot of lateral communication yeah, between absolutely. them yeah. it actually kind of felt uh, uh, yeah, just thinking back to what this meeting was like it kind of felt like everybody else in the room was a bit superfluous yeah and yet these are big hitters who've been recruited in or promoted in because there's a huge job to do. They're all significant individual leaders in their own right. And yet in this room, it's kind of like they've forgotten how to lead. Yeah, they're referring on it. All the lines are going back. Whenever they are making, con they're all going mm. back to that nominal leader. And now here's the other interesting thing. The poor old nominal leader, you know, I think, look at him, you know, bigging himself up here. Yeah, you know, flashing red in the in the top right hand corner. But actually, this guy was completely under the cosh. He was exhausted. He felt like every decision that was going on in this team was having to be made by him. And the reason for that was because he was taking it onto himself. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um and it was absolutely exhausting for him so he was you know, seriously at risk of burnout doing all the hours team member all around him really kind of sitting back um you know they were all very much involved with their own individual functional teams uh, one of them was recruiting like crazy at that point um uh, another had actually just um brought her group over from another part of the business and they kind of merged into this team but um the this this is i think you'd agree not a team in which uh there is any sense of shared leadership no but i will just point out here this is something that i know that i see on a relatively mm. regular basis yeah is that you're there you're running a team session or a team workshop and yet the the noise the the, the communication just come from one or two and it does tend to be that nominal leader like you said this was somebody who was on the chart you know that on the organizational chart just just the one up yeah, yeah. And, and and it's a pattern that i think you know any of us who's been working with teams for a while will have noticed mm -hmm. i've noticed it with teams i've been in i've noticed it with teams that i've observed when i observe i think when you spot something like this going on it's a time to start to get curious mm -hmm. and think about you know who needs to be doing what and how could they be doing it differently yeah no, absolutely and the characteristic of this team is, you know, this is follow the leader. Mm. Um, people are deferring to the leader. The leader, to an extent, and this is often true in these situations, is colluding with that. Yes. I think probably actually quite likes to be making some of the decisions, even though it's absolutely exhausting. Yeah, for they're them. not being forced to do this. There is some element of enjoyment. Yeah. yeah so they're, they're, they're either enjoying it or feeling they have to. Yeah, yeah that's true. Very um, true. So that at the least can some sort of ambivalence around that. Um, the unifying principle in this team is the reporting line. So if I think about other teams, other particularly kind of senior management teams that I've worked with, you know, very often the sense you get is, Actually, all that's happening in the room, the only thing that really brings people together is they happen to all have the same boss. And that was very much how it felt at that point with this particular team. Um, the people in the room didn't really uh, feel, and, and this is even more true of the other team that we'll talk about a little later, the, the people in the room didn't really feel like they were part of this team. They felt they were part of they identified with and they felt accountable with 
for their teams. So in that sense, it wasn't functioning mm. as a team. It was functioning more as a bunch of people who happened to report to the same person, each of whom has responsibility for his or her own area. And there was huge pressure on the nominal leader for the decision, uh, all of the decisions. Um, we've got the image here of the firefighter because that was absolutely how it was. He was the firefighter. He was the relationship maker. He was the one who was holding all of the senior stakeholder relationships in the organization. You know, new team, big mission. He was trying to do 90 plus percent of that on his Todd. Wow. Um, and that put huge pressure on him, mm. absolutely exhausting for him. And actually frustrating for him, frustrating for the rest of the team. Um, if you looked at the meeting, turn taking, you know, those meetings where kind of everybody, if we have creeping death around the room, everybody's waiting for the moment where they have their chance to talk with the leader. Yeah. 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 Well, it was very much one of those that kind of, they have their moment. Then having had their moment, they shut up and some of them literally yeah. did not say another word for the next hour. Because they'd have this. These are all leaders in their own right. And yet these are all leaders in their own right with significant remits, yeah. with significant intersections between the work they're doing and the work of the other teams. Because so none of them are absolutely in silos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, any more than is the case in any other organisation you can think of. And very, very little cross-working. By the way, it, this, this is very true of a lot of particularly senior teams uh, that we get to work with. Yeah. And it, and it raises, without getting into the pointy-headed question, because I'll, I'll leave the pointy-headed questions for another day, I think. Um, yeah, it yeah. does raise the question, is this even really a team? And like you said, we could have a whole webinar on, on what a, a team actually is. Somebody's just asked, actually, Colin, um, was this an open meeting, opening meeting, sorry, where the leader and the HR partner were setting the scene and describing their requirements? Um, no, it was actually supposed to be a working meeting. Oh, it's a working meeting. Okay, so no. So, because you would kind of expect, wouldn't you, some, at some meetings, they are more transmit meetings as opposed to anything else. But no, this was a working meeting. Um, it was, and yeah, look, look. Yeah, if we come back to, I, I won't go back to the no. picture again because we'll see it again a bit later. The um, the all the work was really being done by very few of the people in the room. Um, so yeah, a working meeting with a working with, meeting with nobody else doing the work. Yeah, and yeah, I've heard people say about those meetings, we we're all required to turn up. I have my five minutes. After that, really, the other 55 minutes is a waste of time. And it's interesting because at that moment, you, you know, and, and the person who's saying that is somebody who's in a significant leadership role. Mm. And at that, that moment, it's like they've, they've sort of abdicated the, the job of leadership in that context for some reason. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it's a, a really strange phenomenon. In, in terms of how we behave and, and choose to behave in teams. Let me contrast it with what the aspiration was for this team, which was for really high levels of internal leadership. And this is, of course, where as a coaching colleague and I work with this particular team is where we started to, um, to take the team. An aspiration that there was shared leadership within the team, that it wasn't all on the nominal leader, that the team was really united around impact. It had an 18 month mission, which was absolutely enormous, starting from scratch, literally starting from a, an organization of about five people to a leadership team of eight or nine to recruit about 200 to get some very significant commercial achievements delivered for the business in a really short space of time. So it's all about impact. Um, that really meant that the members needed to be able to work together to drive the overall function with the nominal leader of the team. It couldn't be down to him. There was just too yeah. much to do. Um, what does that mean for him? Well, it means that he 
ought to be free to be able to step in and out of decision making, to allow others to step in, and make the decisions when they're the ones with the best information. And we used the image of the firefighter earlier. If you think about real firefighting situations, you know, teams who are in uh, safety critical environments, that's exactly what they do really well. They get the people with the best information making the decisions because they're the ones who are close to the actual yes. problem. That's what you need to be happening in, the, in this situation as well. The nominal leader able to step out and for the others to lean in a whole load more. We all say lean in these days because we all listen to Brene Brown videos, I think. But, um, high levels of cross-working and interaction. A couple of observations there. Um, one is uh, there needed to be a lot of cross-working because there were a lot of interdependencies. Actually, at the point at which we went into this team, instead of cross-working, some of the teams were either whispering in corridors or they were in open conflict. Two, two of the leaders were actually in open conflict with each other. Um, so rather the opposite mm -hmm. yeah. of where, where you would want to be. Um, the, other, uh, the other observation, high levels of cross-working, probably really hard for a team of nine people to do with all nine of them in the room at one time. Yeah. Uh, so part of what a team in this situation has got to think about is how do we organise our resources a bit better? Mm. And you can't do that if you've all got to be in the room all the time, every time everything's being discussed. Um, and you want them, they want it recognisably to be a team, to feel a team, to behave like a team, to act like a team, to deliver like a team. So this here, Patrick, is what you have is your ideal, isn't it? This is yeah. the ideal that you're looking for with a team with high internal leadership. I'll just say with the questions that are going on at the moment, hang fire because all's going to be revealed um, later on. So don't worry, team roles are going to uh, appear with, with this particular team. So I'm not ignoring you on purpose. Yeah. So, so one, of, one of the things this experience, along with a number of others, uh, of teams of different shapes and sizes helped helped us to do uh, was to put together a, a bit of a model for team impact. And it, it's really simple um, and it's got a number of dimensions to it. First of all, the idea that um, teams like this come together because there's something that needs to happen. There's an impact. Uh, secondly, that how that happens is a function of how they behave with each other. And of course, that's going to take us to team roles. Uh, there's a, a, an identity that goes with it, a feeling of being a team, being part of a team, of that being my team. And the role of leadership is essential there. And I'm going to say that when we're using this term internal leadership, what we mean by this is that if external leadership is leadership of the team, the accountability of the nominal leader, the guy who was wearing the red hat, who was you know, sweating it for everybody. The job of internal leadership is leadership inside the team, and that's the role of every team member. Because for uh, teams to have, teams like this to have the impact they need to have, every team member has got to step up when the situation requires and take their share of leadership. And there's both an internal and an external dimension to this, outward facing um, leadership, uh, leadership of the team as seen by others in the organisation, internally leadership inside the team, how leadership happens in the team. There's an individual and a collective, uh, how we do things, how I do things part of this. Uh, we leads us to looking at the whole team and the dynamics of the team and I leads us to my own role, my own contribution and, and what I bring and offer to the leadership of the team. So our conversations with teams like this have to, uh, have to be all about what you bring that will help to lead this team to have the impact that it needs to have. Oh, team roles, oh. now let's talk oh. about that. Now let's bring in some team roles. Okay, so here's our nominal leader. Very bright, very, very bright bloke, actually. You know, those um, yeah. two strong thinking roles, monitor, evaluator, plant. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, really strong example of both great problem solver, had a history of being a bit, bit of a lone problem solver in the consultancy world before he formed this team. Okay, that makes sense. Um, really strong monitor evaluator, great critical thinking abilities. Um, here he is with his team, uh, and he's got some, some um, pretty good coordinator capabilities as well. He's thoughtful about people, thoughtful about delegation. Now let's just put his team alongside him. I'm wondering for, for those people who are with us today who are familiar with team roles, I wonder what they yeah. notice. <laughs> Observations, please. Yes. What do we notice? So Suki, no, the, the leader wasn't a strong shaper. This is why, I, you know, this is, what can you see just looking at those icons? What, what immediately hits you? They're not a strong shape, but there's definitely a control thing going on. Mm. But it wasn't a shaper thing. It wasn't a, a, a we, we must do this, because actually if we, must, if we must do this was happening, I think they would have felt much more action-oriented than they felt. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, everybody's having a good ponder on that. Mm. Shall I do a little different cut of this? Oh. Too much ME, too much Ooh, yes. evaluator. Yeah, I'm noticing, ah, oh, see, it's all coming through now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Hey, whoa, whoa, hang on, shush, everybody, it's too many, it's everybody's going now. So, too much monitor evaluator, um, plenty of coordinators and team workers. I'm notice, noticing lots of team worker skills and the other team members, um, so they're more likely perhaps to move into listening mode. Yeah. They're all quite similar. Um, Suki, lack of action, um, thoughtful, mm. too many plants, too many of the same. I can only see one implementer, a lot of the same types of behavior, too much yeah. coordinator and monitor evaluator, little CF. Yeah. Every team role is covered, but low on shaper. Well, uh, actually, yeah. every team role wasn't covered, and we'll come back to that in a yes. moment, because nearly, you're nearly right. Ah, somebody's just come in there, actually. I'm going to have to say this, Patrick. Where is the resource investigator? Where is the, yeah, <laughs> where is, and, and, and the answer, by the way, is that the leader was trying as well as everything else to also be the resource investigator with the team and manage the stakeholder uh, relationships, um, spot the opportunities in the business. Oh my goodness. Spot the opportunities in the wider market. Uh, yeah. And yeah. You can see why he's you know, flat, flat out on his back. I mean, literally he turned up the second workshop we did with this team, he turned up and he could barely get a word out, poor bloke. <laughs> Uh, well, you can understand, um, can't you? Yeah, I hope he isn't on a call today. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, he has yeah. our sympathies. Yeah, he does. Um, and yeah, loads of monitor evaluators. So five, um, leaving aside the two HR people who happened to be in that particular meeting. Yeah, um, five uh, people, top three on monitor evaluator. Four, top three on plant. Everybody else in the team had at least one top three team role that was in common with the leader mm. and in common with other people in the team. Which raises something along the lines of cloning. Mm -hmm. Have they all been recruited because they are mini me's? Um, is, this, is this an indication of the culture of the organisation? Because these are all leaders in their own right. Um, so it could be that that culture really values that coordinator, monitor, evaluator, plant behaviour. And so they're the types of behaviours that get promoted. Yeah. Um, it's just people saying all of those things at the moment. Yeah. No, where is the diversity? Yeah, that's interesting because there's probably a bit, uh, bear in mind, most of these people had recently either been recruited into the organisation, promoted within or seconded into this team. There was probably a bit of looking for people who look a bit like me going on here. Mm. Um, but the consequence was the classic thing that happens when you get lots of monitor evaluators, lots of great critical thinkers all wanting to be right in the room yes. together, oh, uh, which yes. is um, deadlock on some really critical decisions, decisions about work, decisions about people, lots of discussion, but no decisions, no clear decisions. A little bit of the Apollo syndrome as well here, isn't it? Yeah. Meredith, you know, noticed in the early research. Yeah, uh, yeah, great point. Because actually, this is a super bright team. Yeah. Yeah, these are not. You know, these were not stupid people at all. 
uh, but as a team, it just was not functioning um, well. And, and it was newly formed, so also the people didn't know each other very well. Um, so one of the great things about helping them to think individually about, well, what am I bringing into this team in terms of team role contributions was just to build that awareness of what are each other, what are we all like as individuals. But um, talk about little action. You know, only one person, one individual strong in each of the three action oriented roles, shaper, yeah, so driving for results, implementer, planning and structuring work, complete a finisher, attending to the detail, making sure that things are done properly. Uh, so really underrepresented. Um, and those three people were absolutely crucial to the functioning of this team. They really needed to, and think about, think about the map of what was going on in the meetings. If those people didn't step up, then the team was very unlikely to progress out of where it was. Uh, and then nobody's strong on that uh, social oriented role around resource investigator. It's a real question for this team about how are you going to handle those critical relationships. And like um, you said, this was going, this is another workload for that nominal leader. They yeah. took this role on as well as everything else. Yes. So, so really important for him that he's able to, if he's going to be the one who does that, and actually, you know, given that there was this quite political environment, there was so much to do, big organisation, mm -hmm. new team, a lot of risk around it. If he was going to be the person who managed those relationships, then that really required the rest of the team to step in, take more of the share of leading the work that the team had to do to free him up to go and do some of those other things. Mm -hmm. That requires a shift for everybody, doesn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's, let's fast forward now to a few months later in a different team. Cannon, before we do that, yeah. actually, before you press that, so this was based on self-perception? This is based on self-perception only, yeah. Okay. So this, uh, and it's a, uh, in my view, that's a bit of a weakness on the work we did with this team. I think we learned some things from working with this team that we've built into work subsequently. Um, because it was based on the preferences of the team. Having said that, it was also a very newly formed team, so they yeah. didn't have a lot of observational data about each other's team role contributions. Okay, so they were very much still in, and somebody's mentioned Tuckman, um, in that sort of forming stage of, of the team, weren't they? Yeah, they were somewhere in the, somewhere in the forming storming. Forming, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. hadn't yet got it figured out. Actually, yeah, a bit of over politeness going on there as well. Well, there was high team worker, wasn't there? So yeah. nobody would want to step on each other's toes. Yeah, exactly. Um, and definitely a preference for people to kind of work things out kind of in little cliques rather than to, to, to tackle the problems head on. Mm. Um, so let's, if we, let's bring in the self-perception and observer assessment idea now. This is a different team. Okay, this so a, this is team two. This is team two, so different organisation. Um, this is work uh, a bit further down the road, having learned some of the lessons also from uh, using our impact model uh, with earlier teams. Um, so in this case, we did uh, observer assessments for every team member, so for the team leader and every member of this team. Very similar in the sense, it's a again, it's a functional leadership team incredibly experienced, very bright people. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, the, um, the team as a whole, which is about, uh, if, if you went all down, down all the layers of the organization, about 150 strong, described their chant by the chief executive as having something like 3000 years of experience within it. Wow. And that, yeah, and the individuals in the leadership team, um, you know, on average, probably about 30 years of experience of working in the sectors that they were working in. Okay, so a f very experienced team working together, so, so senior team. Super experienced team with a super experienced leader who's really strong, as we can see, on his overall Belbin assessment on the three action-oriented roles, completed finisher, shaper, implementer. 
So, so a real doer. Absolutely. Do you know, I'm going to interrupt right now, if you don't mind, Patrick, because this is a page which some people may not, may not um, be familiar with. So when you complete your Belbin self-perception inventory, you're finding out how you see yourself in terms of the Belbin team roles. But obviously, this is only as good as our own self-insight. And um, we sometimes don't know how we come across to others, especially in particular um, scenarios and particular teams. So what we ask people to do is ask other people for their feedback. We call these observer assessments. And we ask you to get a minimum of four observers to tick words that they feel really um, relate to you um, more strongly than most. We have list A words, and those words relate to the strengths of each team roles. And we have list B words, which relate to the weaknesses of each team roles. Because remember, each of these Belbin team roles has strengths, but they also have allowable weaknesses. It's the, the flip side of a coin. So you expect list B words to be ticked as well as list A words. This particular page then looks at those words. You take each team role separately. It's, it, you shouldn't really compare too much but you know, for those team roles. And it's looking at the ratio between the strengths, the list A words for those team roles, and list B, the weaknesses for each team role. So it's looking at the balance between how much strength of each one they're seeing and how much weakness they're seeing. But this is just based, isn't it, on on how other people are um, seeing you. So this can be a real eye opener. Um, I love this page, but sorry, over to you, just in case some people didn't know what it was. Yeah, well, great. So SPI, self-perception, OA, observer assessment. assessment. And what's interesting, so there are a number of interesting things here. And this is where the ex- I love the extra depth we get from doing the observer assessments. Oh, absolutely. It gives us so much more to work on, particularly at an individual level. Um, one simple thing, although it didn't come up as one of the top four team roles for this leader, actually his his number two preferred role was coordinator. And yet he wasn't... It's not, he, it's not being seen, is it? He was not being seen. Not, not being not seen. Not projecting that with his team. Instead, they were going, oh, it's all action, action, action. And yeah. to the point where you know, some of it was definitely tipping into causing a bit of a problem for him particularly uh, and for the team, particularly because... This was the point at which we, we um, all of us went into lockdown this year. Oh, okay. So just this was before, just before lockdown. Mm-hmm. Just before lockdown. So, so you had somebody, okay. So, um, and uh, for, for those of you who are familiar with the Belbin uh, observer words, um, just as a, a bit of fun, yeah, what, what words? words? Yeah, yeah, what words do you imagine might have come up? Okay, so you've got somebody who's seeing the associated weaknesses very much the resource investigator, the shaper, complete a finisher. Mm. Um, so actually, there's, there's weaknesses on, on, on most of those, but some are slightly higher, aren't they? Yeah, um, a blessing when he plays plant, which he almost never does. <laughs> it's, all, it's all strength. So maybe there's something to build there's, on there. There's something to build on. We've got the positives. And, and actually, and, and when he plays monitor evaluator, um almost all strengths very very little weakness but um yeah. yeah definitely on those three action roles and particularly on shaper and complete a finisher so we've got suki here saying impatient confrontational under delegating pushy mm-hmm. yeah that yeah, could be or it could be some of those things uh, the other word that came up a lot and i think probably associated with all of the action roles uh, and particularly with with implementer is is inflexible Yes, inflexible. Oh my goodness, so very action orientated, but mm. it's not deviating. And Heads down. coming into a position where suddenly you're going into a period of rapid change. You know, Will turned upside down in March and April. Um, probably the last thing you want to have uh, uh, yourself described that in that situation is inflexible. At the time when we all had to be as flexible as we possibly could. Okay, Absolutely. Okay. And it's contextual, this, isn't it? It's always contextual. Yeah. 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 So a picture to have in mind is almost somebody who's kind of, got, kind of got their head down, charging into this period of change, going, we just need to drive it harder. And mm-hmm. that's, that, that was the, the feel you got from, from talking, with, talk, talking with him and talking with the team. Okay. 
let's talk about the team. Okay, so he was the nominal leader of a team which also contained leaders. A nominal leader of a team that also contained leaders. Yeah, yeah. leaders with huge amount of experience. Yes, years and years. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what do we notice here? So again, we've got the top three team roles mapped out. This is a, a team map format, which um, actually I learned from Max, who I think is on today's webinar, for, who uh, runs Belb in North America. Yeah. Um, uh, I've kind of simplified it a bit for today. No, thank you. It's, it's similar to the circle, but in a slightly mm, different format. Yeah, it's, it, exactly. it shows the um, information in a slightly different way, which I think gives a different perspective sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, we've got, it's almost like two jigsaws coming together. I think this picture, yeah, you've got um, the, the really strong action roles of the leader, although we know you can flex into coordinator. And then you've got the rest of the team, which kind of is almost kind of the fit on the outside. Absolutely. So can I just quickly clarify? So as we go down each column for the rest of the team is an individual. Yeah, so each and of these saying is that's their first, second, and third role. So the first that's, individual, Scott Plant, is third, coordinator is second, team worker is first, yes, and the second person, so on and so forth. Mm. You're right, it's like a jigsaw, isn't it? Yeah, and of course, there was a real need from the leader's point of view, just like the, uh, the first team we looked at, for him to get the team to step up more, to take more responsibility. And the feedback he was getting is, you need to change. Yeah. So the big question for him um, was, how can he help the team to step in more? I think one of the answers was, let's do our Belbin reports and actually create some awareness. Um, and let's do observer assessments because that helps us to recognize what we're projecting to each other, which may be different from what we prefer to do. Mm. Well, it gives us this language, doesn't it? It gives us, if we start with the self and we can understand us and our mm. strengths and weaknesses, it gives, starts us giving that language of, of being able to identify things like this and actually making it not so personal, doesn't it? And also understanding, and we spoke about this earlier, the difference between your self-perception, where you think your strengths are. So in this case, you know, coordinator was, was a lot higher and actually what other people are seeing. Yeah. And then that's the conversation, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And you know, easing back more into a coordinator role, driving the team less hard, was part of the key with this team to allowing the others to come in and contribute ideas. Look at these strong idea or, oriented roles. Yeah. Plant, you know, the creative problem solver, resource investigator, the spotter of opportunities. Um, you know, the team that's awash with them. By the way, lots and lots of um, former, very senior sales and marketing people in this team. So you're yeah, not surprised in those roles are well represented. Um, bringing in, um, by leaning back, giving them the space to bring in ideas. What could we be doing differently? How could we ta be tackling this in a different way? What else should we be thinking of doing? All those sorts of things more space for those instead of let's just carry on doing this to get results, um, which was liberating for them and liberating for the leader. Because he had been working every hour that God sends, trying to drive. Trying to drive things this, forward, yeah. And fix the problem by himself when actually others in his team were probably much better equipped as problem solvers. Not because there's anything wrong with him, but just because that's their natural strength. But before we did this, there wasn't the space for them to come in. You can imagine yeah. it, can't you? If you've got the nominal leader is in, those, in that task zone, it's yeah. not allowing anybody else any space. Well, it, it, exactly. And that's where the, um, the space needs, the nominal leader needs to create the space for the team to come in. That's where this process is a, is a really helpful step towards that change. And then the leaders within the team need to bring their stuff to contribute to the overall performance of the team. Otherwise, it's, it's a very one-sided thing. Yeah. 
and far too much weighed on the shoulders of one person. And actually, one of the lovely consequences of doing the work with this particular team was that leaders been able to step out so far and for the team to run things so, so much themselves that he's been able to take on a different project in another part of the business and help them where they really needed strengths around uh, particularly planning, structure, organisation um, and delivery for performance. So he's helped another part of the business to turn things round, which he just did not have anything. He didn't have the capacity to do what he was already doing uh, at the point we started working um, in um, sort of around about Easter time. Um, so yeah, what I love about this is it raises so many questions about both the, the person in charge, but also about what leadership the people inside the team take. And as a process, I'm going to sort of wrap up really with a um, thought about, you know, what we did was not rocket science. I always think, you know, these are just simple things that you do well. And every time you do them, you learn how to do them a bit better. Um, you know, first of all, actually engaging um, with the team, understanding, observing a bit of what's going on. We weren't able to do our nice little um, pencil heat map diagram, our, um, our uh, force centred network diagram, uh, because everybody was meeting virtually by then. Mm -hmm. But we were able to, the, one of the nice things about it being virtual is you can switch your video off and you can switch your, and put yourself on mute. And even if you're sitting in the meeting and they know they, you're there within two minutes, they've forgotten. Because Ooh. you're silent and invisible. Cool, you can be a real sort of fly on the wall in that yeah. case, can't you? Yeah, so for those of you into your you know, observer effects in psychology, that's, a, that's quite a nice place to be, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so under, you know, understanding a bit about what's going on in the situation. So that was meeting with the leader, meeting with his boss, um, uh, getting experience of talking to different team members, getting experience of and observing them in action. Secondly, really crucially getting both the observer assessments as well as the self-perceptions. So getting lots of really rich data around team role contributions. Yeah. And they all fed back on each other. Uh, some of them also had observers from outside the team. Mm -hmm. yeah. Each observation, those, those um, observer words, it's only about 15 minutes to complete, but you get so much and they get so much from it. Oh, it's a rich layer of information, isn't it, that is needed, especially in this type of situation. Yeah, exactly. And then the virtual workshop was just um, two or three hours where we took them through the structure of the Belvin report. So they understood what uh, enough to be able to interpret their individual Belvin reports with observer assessments. And then the meat of it, more than half the time was sitting with the map we just looked at mm -hmm. and going, what's this telling us? How do we want to deal with this? Um, what do I need to offer? And what do I need to ask my colleagues for this to work the way we need it to work? So it's so asking questions at a very, very gentle level around how we all take a share of leadership. And that followed up by much deeper individual coaching sessions. And in some cases, some three-way sessions where we sat down with the team leader and a team member and we did a, here's, here are your top team roles, here, is, here are their top team roles, let's, let's work them through together so you get the best out of each other. And that's a standard Belbin report, which mm. yeah, as, as, as I've said to you before, Joe, yeah, top value at 15 quid. <laughs> Um, yes, we'll do the sales bill later. Um, no, it's just, uh, just these working relationship reports, aren't they? They just put people together so you can compare and contrast top team roles, yeah. um, or the whole team role profile. And sometimes when we're very different, we need to have that conversation because sometimes when people have completely different team roles to ourselves, like we have here, mm -hmm. us, Patrick, there can sometimes be a level of, well, I don't quite respect that as much because it's not my, my preferred way of doing things. So to get everybody to sit down and say, this is me, this is how I prefer to work, and then work out where those pain points might be, but to be able to talk about them and appreciate that diversity, appreciate the difference, really strengthens relationships, as it does if you find you have very similar team roles. <laughs> yes, yes. So, it doesn't so. have to be different. It can be those which got very similar profiles as well. 
Yeah, so two, I always think too similar or too different, different can create yeah. um, their own sorts of problems. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and one of the places this is leading us is this whole business of, um, of internal leadership is uh, really all about uh, being inclusive. It's about having a sense of belonging. And if you think about that language, that's very similar to the language that organizations are using when they talk about cultures of being diverse, inclusive, uh, equal, mm. people feeling they belong. Um, and that can be a real challenge. You know, there, is, um, there are some countries at the moment where, for example, you, you know, it's the US, for example, right now has a blanket ban on doing diversity training. But actually, I think we can use this language and use these approaches, and this is this is the work that's now in progress, to help people understand how by being better internal leaders, they can also be better allies to their colleagues. Okay. The language is really similar. The behaviors are really similar. There are a few subtle differences, um, but that will really help to make organizations advance where they want to go in terms of being better workplaces for everybody. Um, and I think whether that's working with people at the team level, I have a fundamental belief that the team's the unit of change. Yeah. I think that's probably something we share. I think so. Um, uh, or whether it's working with the champions for those changes in the organizations to understanding how to make change happen right down into every single team, because if it doesn't change, change in every single team it hasn't changed that's correct yeah yeah um and that we, we had some great conversations actually as a result of one of these webinars uh, a month or so ago uh pill d'souza's webinar um that i think has, has really started to move us along that road so that this is the cutting edge for where we're going and this is really exciting stuff i think patrick isn't it this is um this is really making change change happen yeah and I quite a profound and cultural way. Yeah. Wow. Well, I guess I hope we've got a whole load of questions. From Obviously, but no, we have. We have. What I think is most useful when we we go through these is, or the thing that always resonates is these these are teams which are full of leaders. These are teams that have leaders within them who are leaders in their own right. And yet it's this nominal leader who is there purely because of the reporting structure who mm. seems time and time again, and I have seen this, Patrick, time and time again. It's those that seem to take this nominal leadership role of which is quite unhealthy. Mm. But what do you need to do is that rec recognizing this is the case. It's understanding that's the case, being able to start with yourself and understand what you need to do to lean in as a leader and what the nominal leader needs to do to, to lean out, to make the space for the, the leaders to, to do their, their bit within that team setting. And it can be difficult, can't it? Because these team settings, when you're looking perhaps at exec or board levels as well, they tend to be quite clony. They tend to be quite similar, don't they? Well, they can, and then we have to work with what we have. And I think the, the, the great value for the nominal leader is when they get this, they realize how much easier it makes their own life and their own job. Do they start smiling again? That's the goal. And yes, <laughs> um, and it actually, if we think about the, uh, the second case study we've just looked yes. at. Yeah. Mm. Uh, um, the, 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 the two things I'd say come out of that, um, a lot's come out of that, but two things in particular. One is, there was a real sense of the nominal leader of that team just breathing a big sigh of relief, feeling yes. like oh, I, I was putting myself under so much pressure before and now I'm actually I have more capacity. I've got a better view of everything that's yeah. going on. Yeah. And people have stepped up and I'm so glad. Tick. That's where we need to get to, don't we? Um, Peter's got a good question here. Um, what do you do with a flat organisational structure where everyone is his own boss and the owner of the company, who is largely not present, is the boss of everyone? 
Oh, yes. Conflicts are not handled and abuse is not dealt with because the main leader is not available to observe such. Okay, so it's almost like the absent leader mm. in a way, isn't it? Yeah. The boss great. of everybody, but never actually there. Well, great question. Um, I, I can think of a team um, where I was working last year which felt very like this. Um, in a sense, it was almost the, the, the leader of the team was such... was so much trying to be Mr. Nice Guy that, um, that you've got the opposite of the two examples we were looking at of you know, the leader overleading. Um, and the same process, knowing what, it, see, spotting what's going on, mm. observing, uh, getting feedback about who's contributing what team role strengths, yeah setting up a conversation about leadership within the team and making it not about the one person but making it about everybody who has a role in leading yeah it, the, the, you know, somebody um uh, somebody very smart said to me recently that often the, the the hardest things to do are things which things like those that sound really simple that resonates that does resonate yeah. absolutely but it, i think what you really need to do is giving permission for everybody to take the role of leader as and when yeah. is required isn't it and so it's not always somebody else's responsibility yeah. and say like, hey you know she trusts everybody to a fault to do the right thing well that's great up to a point but what is the objective of the team you said that right at the beginning didn't you when you had your high internal leadership everybody needs to know what is the impact what is it that mm -hmm. the team needs to do and yeah. If people aren't pulling their weight, then that's the conversation, isn't it? To get everybody to internally. Yeah, exactly. What are we here to do? What are we here yeah. for? Um, what's the result of us having come together? Absolutely. Okay, another good one. How do companies, teams, people recognise they need support to get better results? So how does the beginning of the process start? For example, how did you know? How, so how did you come to come up with those examples today, Patrick? What was it that made them think, crikey, we need some help? Well, uh, in both of those cases, it was somebody uh, in this, in one case, it was the, um, the manager at the next level up. Uh, in the other case, it was actually the HR person who was sat at the table taking up half the airtime. <laughs> uh, um, who had gone, there's something going on here that needs some, needs some help. And then an openness in that initial exploration to go, yeah, let's, let's do this process because we need the help and we can't carry on doing things as we are, or we're either going to run into significant difficulties or we're not going to get done the things that we have come together to do. I think, you know, when there's something at stake, you've got a, a will to have a go at it yeah. and somebody spotted, yeah, this is what's needed, that's, that, then you've got a way in. Yeah. Um, you, what you can't do is push it on onto people. No, no, you, I, I've noticed that actually, Pat, you can't, this isn't something that you do to individual, do to the team. The team have to find it themselves. They have mm. to really buy in. You have to have buy in from everybody. Otherwise it isn't going to work. I'm really sorry to cut you short here, but we've got, a, sorry, Helen, I got lost underneath my bits of paper. You can't see the mess here. Somebody actually emailed uh, a, a question in. Um, currently exploring the evident disconnect between CEO MDs and the HR director type. So a disconnect between CEO and the HR director. And it'd be interesting to know if senior HR type people typically fall into one of the Belvin types in a peer group environment and how the current pandemic pressures could be causing conflict or disconnect with the types who typically have those CEO roles. That is a really good question. Um, we're going to answer that, but if you do need to go right now, because we're exactly on time, don't worry. We'll keep all of this in the bit at the end to make sure that you get the answers to all these questions. But thank you so much for those who are now saying that they have to go. It's been wonderful to have you with us. Thank you. Um, it's a good question. Do you think there's a typical Belvin team role profile for uh, an HR director type? Thinking about the HR directors who I meet, no, they're, they're as different as anybody else and yeah. yeah 
what one of the things that Deborah McGovern at Belbin taught me when she first accredited me in, in uh, using Belbin, I'm not going to say how many years ago. A few years ago. Uh, yeah, a few years ago, is um, beware of labelling. Yeah. Um, you know, my experience is whether you're talking about functional role against functional role or country against country versus country. Um, we've always got all of the team roles represented. They come out in different ways. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure. It'd be a great question to ask Victoria, actually. In no, no, it will do. We're going to look at the data. I'm going to get um, Vicky, who's our head of R&D, to join us for a webinar soon. And we can ask her all of these um, questions and she'll just be able to come up with all the stats. But normally, I, I don't think there is. I have found that people do plan. I don't know if this isn't just HR, but the role they play within a senior leadership team and the role that they play within their particular, let's use the word silo for the lights, can sometimes be very dif different. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's where a disconnect can be. I also think that sometimes when people are newly into an executive team, they feel that they need to be a certain team role type, whatever that may be, because they want to, they're there, you know, they're in the exec team, they, they, yeah. they feel they need to belong within that team. And so sometimes there can be a little bit of an issue. Yeah, and I think that's of, often more about the organisation's culture than it is yes. about the, the functional culture of the role. Yeah, no, absolutely. So what we're saying, Helen, is I think there can be an evident disconnect between the CEO and the HR director. I don't think it's, if that's anything to do that we can put team roles as the, the answer to that, I'm afraid, um, in this situation. Um, but remember, during a pandemic, different people do react in different ways. And so you are seeing a lot of quite stress behaviour, quite crisis behaviour coming through, which is sometimes when we're a little bit more blinkered um, within our, our top team roles. Yeah, actually from that point of view, I think the stress that some of these teams have been feeling yeah. in a sense gets alleviated when people have got more permission to say, this is what I'm strong at and this is how it contributes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, yeah. I, I don't believe that you know, clean, nothing is the answer to everything. No. But I do think that's one of those areas where team roles is, is really helpful because it allows us to be strong at what we're strong at. No, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Right. Thank you, everybody. There are still questions here. Um, for the person who's anonymous, um, Patrick Lencioni's Five Dysfunctions, we have got an article that links Belbin with Patrick Lencioni. It's a wonderful framework. You can use both together. It's wonderful. I will put a link on that on the email that we send out. Um, does leaders need to select team roles for a strategy team? Do you, have, do you have to have all of these team roles within your strategy teams? Do you know, sometimes you don't, but you need to know where they are because sometimes you really do need them. It's an awareness. It starts with awareness every time, not have we got all nine? What is this team needs to do? What do we have? What am I contributing? And then if need be, where can I go if we need other behaviours to come in there? Um, so hopefully that helps as well. It's been a delight, Patrick. It's been wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with us.